Hi, welcome to our second lecture, plant cell. Today we'll be looking at a plant cell and um, we want to see why is a plant cell so important in our study of crop anatomy. All living things emanate from the cell. Yes, all living things emanate from the cell. The cell was first originally identified by Robert Hooke in 1635 to 1703. An English microscopist for the first time in the 17th century studied the internal structure of a thin slice of buttercock with the help of a crude microscope. Now, as a plant body consists of a number of small microscopic box-like compartments called cells. The cells are the universal elementary units of organic structure. So, uh, in other words, a plant cell can be defined as microcosm, having a definite boundary or the cell wall within which complicated chemical reactions are going on. You know, so if a cell is devoid of uh, devoid of this chemical reaction, it is termed to be an inert cell or a dead cell. Okay, so every living thing emanates from a cell. A combination of several cells bring brought about the tissue. We've talked about this in our previous class. So it is important that we look at the cell if we want to talk about the anatomy of a plant. It's from the cell that we will now get to the tissue and then to the organs and then the systems. All right. So the plant cell, like I told you, is a box-like compartment. It's everything that it needs it inside. It synthesizes what it needs. It reproduces itself. It grows. It expands. It moves. Okay. So the cells are the universal elementary units of organic structure. They are the, the simplest form of life. The simplest form of life all right so now this cell the, the discovery of cell brought about several things further studies into it by the likes of um Kolika in 1861 who gave the name the cytoplasm um root of vico went further to talk about the protoplast and um uh, Farmer and more talked about meiosis for such divisions and so on and so forth. A lot of scientists started looking into different aspects of the cell. After Robert Hooke had made the first discovery about the, the cell itself. All right. So went further and gave about talk about the cell theory, which was founded by Dix Clendon, a German bot botanist, and Schwann, a German zoologist who sponsored the theory that all animal and plant organisms are composed of cells. Prior to them, several other workers also put forward the similar views. Mabel, 1808, suggested that plants are formed by a membranous cellular tissue. Lamarck, 1819, also suggested that nobody can have life if its constituent parts are not cellular tissue or are not formed by cellular tissue. Topping, Mayen, and Von Moore also put forward the similar views in the beginning of 19th century. Dutrechet, however, start, stated the work, started the work of systematic comparison of plant and animal tissue. So all of these took place during the founding of cells. Okay? So it gave rise to a whole lot of things and that led into the discovery of cell. However, when we want to talk about cell, there are two major types of cell. And we have the eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells and the prokaryotic cells. The prokaryotic cells are single cellular. That means they are a complete organism. Like the bacteria, the virus, they are a complete organism. All right, okay? The prokaryotic cell I'm talking about. They contain a cytoplasm, a cell wall, a plasma membrane, a nucleoid, not a definitive nucleus, a nucleoid. 
they have this pili for which they use for uh, moving and flagella to move around within um, the medium of growth. All right. Meanwhile, the eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell is multicellular. It means on its own, it cannot exist. It needs to ex be in multiples to form a tissue, to form organ, to form systems, which then becomes the organism to exist. Okay? In this one, we have the cytoskeleton, we have the plasma membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus, the nucleolus. So you see the definite difference is that there is a defined nucleus, but that of prokaryotic has no defined nucleus. The Golgi apparatus, the vesicle, and a whole lot of other things that the eukaryotic cell contains, but the prokaryotic cell doesn't contain. So, what is a plant cell? I've told you about the discovery of the plant cell, the, the process that led to the formation of the plant cell, so what is actually the plant cell? Plant cells are multicellular organisms composed of millions of cells with specialized functions at maturity. Such specialized cells may differ greatly from one another in their structure. However, all plant cells have the same basic eukaryotic, eukaryotic organization. <laughs> They contain a nucleus, a cytoplasm, and a subcellular organelles, and they are enclosed in a membrane that defines their boundaries. Certain structures, including the nucleus, can be lost during cell maturation, but all plant cells begin with a similar complement of organelles. What it means is that as they grow, as they grow to a certain maturing stage, the nucleus in the cell begin to disappear. Hmm? begin to disappear because it no longer needs it okay that is at the point when there is no more division no more growth is expected so the nucleus begin to disappear but however at the growth at the beginning stage all of them come grow with complete sets of organelles plant cells are differentiated from the cells of other organisms by their cell walls okay so we know we, we a lot of you already know about um, uh, animal cells Animal cells and plant cells. Animals have their own cells, plants have their own cells. But the distinct difference is that the animal cell does not contain a cell wall, it does not contain a chloroplast, it does not contain a central vacuum. Okay? While the plant cell contains this cell wall made up of cellulose, the chloroplast, which helps in uh, photosynthesis, and the central vacuoles. The central chloroplast within plant cells can undergo photosynthesis. That means they can produce glucose or food in short form. In doing so, the cells use the carbon dioxide that they, they are able to obtain and they release oxygen. Certain structures, including the nucleus, can be lost during cell maturation. But all plant cells begin with a, with a similar complement of organelles. I believe this is a repetition of what I have already uh, put up. Okay, so plant cell has many different parts. Each part of the cell has a specialized function. All right, so these are the plant cell parts. Um, the cell wall. This is the cell wall, the cell membrane, Golgi apparatus, the chloroplast, the vacuole, uh, the raphid crystal, and the druse crystal. This is a needle form. This is in um, a ball form. These crystals are mostly made up of salts. Okay, they're mostly made up of salt, calcium oxalate, to be precise. Okay, so um, we have the mitochondria. We have the cytoplasm. We have the amyloplast, a starch grain. The large vacuole, which this is, um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum the nucleolus, the, nucleo, the nucleus and the nucleolus, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the ribosomes, and the Golgi apparatus. So all of these constitute the body parts of a plant cell. So if you want to really understand more about it, the subsequent lectures that will come will be dealing with different parts of this cell 
their role, the, 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 how they are structured, their chem, mostly the, their chemical compositions, uh, the functions they carry out, a brief description of their functions, and then uh, you get to get more understanding in depth of what uh, the plant cell looks like. This is a 3D version of the plant cell which tends to show uh, clearly how the structure of the cell is like. The nucleus, the cut up inside, showing the nucleus, okay? We have the nucleoplasm. The nucleoplasm is the liquid surrounding the nucleus, okay? We have the nuclear envelope, okay? And we have the nucleopore. The nucleopore is the point where things move in and out of the nucleus, okay? So we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, smooth in the sense that there is no ribosomes on them. The rough endoplasmic reticulum have ribosomes on them. Um, we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is all of these except the nucleus. Uh, everything that comes that is inside the cell except the nucleus. The ribosomes are these particles that are floating within the cytoplasm. The cytoskeleton is the body surrounding the cytoplasm. We have the cell membrane. We have the vacuole. We have the chloroplast. This is the chloroplast where the photosynthesis takes place. We have the plasmodesmata. We have the mitochondria. The plasmodes matter is where there is communication between one cell to the other, movement of molecules from one cell to the other. So we'll talk more about that as well. We have vesicles which help to transport um, synthesized products such as proteins from in the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. We have Golgi apparatus, we have the lysosome, we have the peroxisome. Um, yeah, that's basically all the parts of the cell. You need to understand these parts of the cell. You need to understand how to draw them. You need to know how to um, label them as well. So I, I would advise that you learn this art of drawing and labeling them because it may become very important to you during your continuous assessment or your exams. All right, we want to look at the protoplasm first. Um, we will try to make a clear understanding about what the protoplasm is from what the cytoplasm is. Okay, the protoplasm is known as all the living parts of the cell except the cell wall. Okay, the cell wall is not a living part of the plant cell, but so it is not a constituent. Of the protoplasm. All the living parts of the cell without the cell wall is known as the protoplasm. Now you can see from here it includes the cell membrane or cell plasma membrane, the nucleus, the cytoplasm. These combine constitute the protoplasm. While the cytoplasm is everything within the cell except the nucleus. Everything within the cell with exemption of the nucleus. So every organelles, every dissolved substance, every vesicles, everything inside the, cyto the, the cell, including the, 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 the liquid-like stuff, which we call um, um, which we call the liquid surrounding the nucleus, okay? All of them constitute the cytoplasm, okay? So the living parts outside the nucleus are called the cytoplasm. Also, the cell wall is not included because the cell wall is not a living part of the cell, all right? So let's go further and discuss more about the protoplasm. So according to Oxley, Protoplasm is the physical basis of life. In a living cell, the living substance is known as protoplasm. It is a thick fluid 
more when it's when it's thick when it's a fluid it's active it's more active when it's a fluid or a jelly like substance when it is inactive inert it is generally grayish or yellowish somewhat yellowish in color and tra always transparent and many small granules are found in it which are known as food granules a complex substance found to be dispersed in water that means the food granules okay the protoplasm of developing plant cells remember the word a developing plant cell constitutes of 90 percent water why the seeds is less than 90 percent of water which thereby makes it having a thick consistency when in seeds okay so in seeds it is in an inert form and that's why it is less of water remember what i said earlier on that it is more active when it is in fluid nature and less active when it is in jelly like substance so in seed it is an, a seed that a dormant seed is one that is like that contains a jelly like substance in its protoplasm and thus is inactive okay so the protoplasm such as that in seed are somewhat inactive and becomes active after absorbing sufficient water and that is the point of germination of seeds okay all right so uh, in protoplasm we have proteins proteins that are made up of carbohydrate hydrogen oxygen nitrogen sometimes sulfur and phosphorus of various types of various types we also have fats carbohydrates and some inorganic salts are all constituents of protoplasms the chemical composition of protoplasm um, for in terms of elements we have oxygen com comprising of 62 percent carbon 20 percent hydrogen 10 percent and nitrogen 3 percent while the remaining five percent is made up of a combination of calcium ion magnesium chlorine phosphorus potassium sulfur which are very important and trace elements of boron copper fluorine manganese and silicon all these elements are found in their ionic state or essentially in adenosine triphosphate atp which is the form in which uh, energy when energy is required plants use this atp as a source of energy to carry out its metabolic activities you'll get to know more about that during your crop physiology lectures protoplasm of each cell contains certain organic substances including carbohydrate fat protein and nucleoproteins as the most important ones the carbohydrates which has the symbol CHO constitute 13 percent of the protoplasm important carbohydrates include glucose sucrose starch cellulose glycogen etc the granules either remain suspended or dissolved in the cytoplasm they are responsible for the production of energy okay so what i mean is the granules of these starch bodies are most times suspended within the what the cell such as um, those uh, vesicles i mean those um, ribosomes, granules, the things we saw inside that looks like um, granules are called suspended particles or they are dissolved in the cytoplasm. Fats. Fats or lipids consist of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen elements as well. They are formed by the combination of glycerol and fatty acids. They contain lesser amount of oxygen than carbohydrates. All right? However, they contain more energy than carbohydrates. The cell membrane consists of fat. When we get to the cell membrane, you'll get to see more of that. Protein also constitutes 15% of protoplasm. Proteins are formed by the combination of the molecules of amino acid. Remember in your biology, we talked about, they talked about uh, amino acid, 20 amino acids that are formed in nature different proto, uh, proteins are formed from the combination of these amino acids so one to two two to four four to five six to seven eight to nine twenty to nineteen like that the combination of this amino acid give rise to different various various 
proteins, different various proteins of different lengths and different flexibility of forms. And so, naturally, organisms of different nature are known by their difference in their proteins, protein makeup. So, you see um, one person, another person, the things that differ from them mostly that makes them different is that their protein constituents are different. You have one amino acid in this person, you have a different one in another person. That's because nature has made it so via the formation of natural 20 amino acids which led to the formation of different forms of protein molecules. So in the protoplasm, we have proteins of different nature in different cells. Proteins are not soluble in fat, but however, many are soluble in water and salt solutions such as globulin. There are other forms in which it's dissolved, other soluble natures. Okay, nuclear proteins, the most complex substance ever found in the protoplasm. The compounds of nucleic acid and protein is a combination of nucleic acid and protein. The protoplasm consists of ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid. These two substances are found in the protoplasm. The RNA is found in the complete cell. That means it's found both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. While DNA is found in only in the nucleus. In each cell, the RNA and DNA is mainly concerned with metabolic processes. It does not concern with anything else. It's mainly concerned with metabolic processes. The nucleic acid of two living beings are never the same. The reason is because of the protein differences. The protein differences is what makes sure that the nucleic acid in one being is different from the other because the nucleic acid is a constituent of protein. It's, it's formed from protein. Okay? So other chemical substances such as latex, alkaloids, vitamins, hormones, antibiotics, etc. are found within the plant cells. The molecules of all these substances are well organized to form the protoplasm. So, what is the physical nature of protoplasm? I told you earlier on, it's a, a grayish substance. It has a colloidal state because of the proteins in it. The proteins of protoplasm are found in water in a colloidal state. They are formed in minute granules consisting of several molecules. Colloids of protoplasm remain hydrated. That means they have absorbed water. And the amount of hydration depends upon various conditions such as the state of the cell, the more amount of water in the cell, um, the temperature of the surrounding environment of the cell, and the health condition of the cell as well. The distribution of the protoplasm. The protoplasm remains divided into two parts, as I said earlier on, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is usually a transparent, slightly viscous fluid with inclusions of various sizes, inclusions which are the ribosomes, the endoplasmic ri ribosomes, the Golgi apparatus, the, plus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast, etc. Permeability, the ease with which substances pass through a member differ. It is much easier for water and fats, whereas ions and proteins do so with great difficulty through plasma membrane. I told you earlier on that the protoplasm consists of the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm. So the physical nature of protoplasm is that it also has a permeability, which means that things have to go into it and out of it. And the things that can go into it easily are water and fats or out of it. However, ions and proteins find it difficult to go in or out. This is so in order to create a defensive mechanism against any unnecessary movement of ions that might lead to the denaturing of the cell. Okay, so it is naturally a defense mechanism that is making it difficult for proteins to go in and out. Remember I told you that proteins differ from one another from one cell to the other. So imagine another cell having its protein easily moving out and going into another cell. It definitely changes the nucleic nature of that cell, which also changes its functionality. 
So in order to reduce this issue from happening, it made it difficult for proteins to move in and out of the cell. The permeability of protoplasm is the active and passive force on the particles passing through the living protoplasmic membrane. I believe that is self-explanatory, but however, let me go further to explain. What I mean by active is that the cell is consciously, this, the protoplasm system, the movement of, a move, movement of activities is going out through the normal channels, okay? Passive, it means it is either diffusing through it, through the cell walls, the plasma membrane, not through those uh, plasmodes matter. But when it's active, it's going through the uh, plasmodes matter. That is an active movement. Means something is going through the right channel. Passive is when it's going through the channel where there is no passage, but it can pass through in the form of water dissolving through. Okay. In instances where the cell, the site, the protoplasm contains more salt than water. Water from adjoining cells or intercellular spaces can permeate into the inner cell because of the, the force of osmosis. That is a passive movement. Okay? So, this is what I try to explain to you. So, in our next class, we'll look at the plasma membrane. So, this is a very brief class because uh, I just want you to have a good understanding of what the protoplasm is. Having a clear understanding of the protoplasm and the constituent part parts of the cell will give us, will take us further to understand more about other parts of the cell. Okay, so in our next class, we will be looking at the plasma membrane. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comment section or in the avail other available means. Also, endeavor to subscribe to the channel so you can get these videos, more updated videos on other topics directly to you and you will not miss a thing. So thank you for being a part of this class. Um, endeavor to go through them over and over again. We'll see in our subsequent class. Bye-bye for now.